Right then, so we've got some um, ground to cover in the next couple of days. Uh, we were looking at uh, sort of how surrealism spreads in Europe uh, in the 1930s, uh, and we were looking at how it seems to have had some impact on Picasso uh, in the mid-30s, and this seems to coincide, Picasso's thorough interest in, in surrealism seems to coincide on a certain level with an increased political awareness because of the Spanish Civil War. The rise to power of General Francisco Franco and his fascist party, um, which led to the overthrow of the elected Republican government in Spain, and then a, a civil war for three years, and Franco being then installed in power, right? Uh, not elected, but installed in power, uh, and remaining so for the next 35 years, right? 40 years almost. Uh, and this in Picasso's living in Paris, where he spends the majority of his career, having moved back right after World War I. And he, uh, for this moment in the mid-30s, becomes very much interested in not only um, his identity as a, as a Spaniard, uh, but also uh, uh, surrealism. And not all of his works, surrealist works, are, are, are political. Though just the ones I'm showing you are, right? <laughs> Uh, because of what's here locally. There are other ones that are, are quite surrealistic um, and deal with other issues typical for Picasso. Um, uh, uh, erotic images of women, for example, is, is something that he picks up on as well. But we don't have any here to show you. So we looked at the bullfight image on your right, uh, where we see the bull goring the horse. Um, the gored horse seems to have a uh, uh, resonance for Picasso. Because the horse in the center of the Minotaur's, the Minotaur's battle on your left, the Minotaur Maki, is also wounded and spilling its guts from the same place on the horse. It's just a little harder to see right here, uh, where the horse has been wounded. Uh, again, by the bull, right? So, uh, in this respect, one wonders whether the bull isn't a metaphor for something in particular. And... For Picasso, this bull as a metaphor seems to be somewhat fluid. And by that I mean the thing that it refers to changes uh, from work to work. But in both of these, um, I'm absolutely sure it's Franco uh, menacing uh, others. And, and, and in our bullfight scene, uh, Spain fighting back against sort of the rise of the fascist element under Franco. Um, but the fact that the the matador that appears in the Minotaur's battle on the left as a woman draped over the back of the horse, and she's got, uh, someone pointed out after class, uh, Minotaur's outfit, or excuse me, uh, Toreador's outfit on, right? Uh, the bullfighter's outfit. Um, but that figure draped across the back of a, of a rearing animal evokes the idea of the rape of Europa, the... the uh, uh, Greek myth of uh, the woman that is is uh, seduced uh, by Zeus in the in the guise of a bull. Um, here, Picasso's translated that he's being he's being a little loose with the original because it's not an illustration of the myth. It's it's Picasso's sort of personal mythology, um, and so the woman becomes this reference to Europa being menaced, Europa being injured, or at least her horse being injured, and the person doing that injury is this minotaur, and the minotaur being bound in a labyrinth, as we talked about on Tuesday, right, the minotaur comes from this ancient myth of the, of the half-son of the king of Crete, King Minos of Crete, whose wife slept with a bull, right, and gave birth to this hybrid monster, right, well that debased humanity of being hybrid, being half bull, half man. And the fact that he lives in a labyrinth is this metaphor for madness. Right? Labyrinth, the maze, right? Metaphor for madness. And so the Minotaur becomes, for Picasso, a metaphor for Franco. Spain gone mad. Right? Uh, and here with the sword, now having injured this horse, certainly meant to be Europa, and now threatening 
the little girl on the left uh, with the flowers holding up a candle and the fellow on the left climbing the ladder looking very much like Jesus and climbing the ladder uh, suggesting perhaps religion fleeing even away uh, hiding in the shadows in the window up above two women with doves so certainly the idea of peace hiding right in some sort of citadel uh, and our our bull our minotaur looks as if he's about to try to ex extinguish the candle that the little girl is holding right? uh, to put out that light. And I don't need to sort of press the point about what putting out a light is a metaphor for, right? Extinguish death, right? Or death of hope, uh, death of a future. Um, and we saw going back early, early in Picasso's career that the little girl here uh, that's holding Picasso's hand Remember, Picasso's the Harlequin in the Sultan box. It's a self-portrait. The little girl that's holding his hand was, at that point in his career, 30 years earlier, a metaphor for Spain. He's kind of holding on to some of his traditions as he's looking toward his future as an artist in, in Paris, right? Well, here our little girl is very much the same thing. She's this metaphor for the innocence of Spain. And her light about to be extinguished by this demonic power that is Generalissimo Francisco Franco who did not die until the late, like, 1979. He's in power, yeah. They used to make fun of him in the first years of Saturday Night Live. Right? When Chevy Chase used to do the news on Saturday Night Live, he'd say, and Generalissimo Francisco Franco is still alive. Right? And that would, you know, those were the first three years. I remember that when I was in high school. Right? And I didn't even know who he was at the point. I hadn't taken art history yet. I didn't know who he was. That's how I learned all this stuff, is through art history. Right? So, uh, Picasso is quite enraged because the news of what's happening in Spain, of course, is filtering its way in. And when your, your homeland is, is admired in a civil war, I don't care where you are and how expatriated you are, you care. Right? And Picasso's ears perk up, and he really becomes more interested in, in exploring um, his Spanish heritage, his Spanish character. And he does this through his uh, prints and paintings, um, and we'll look at uh, a print and, and then one more painting this. Um, he, he did a, a pair of prints called The Dream and Lie of Franco. Um, and he means them to be incredibly immediate, even though he works on them over a period of time. And you'll notice he does not even account for the reversal process. Right? Because remember how prints are made. If we talk, we, we, you know, you have, to, you have to you carve a matrix that's then uh, rubbed with ink. And then you press it onto a piece of paper, transferring the ink, which means that uh, the print, as it exists on the paper, has to, as it exists on the matrix, has to be in reverse. Otherwise, you get that mirror, right? And many of you are in uh, Professor Proenza's class and can attest to this difficulty, right? But he's just gone straight in, right? Signature at the bottom, uh, the date, and you'll notice, is right down to a, a, a day of the year. 8th of January, 1937. And uh, he wants to maintain that sense of immediacy, right? This is news that's happening uh, at the time. Uh, this is after now the war has begun. So during, with the Minotaur's battle on the left, um, the Spanish Civil War has yet to begin. Franco is just a threat, right? But with the dream and lie of Franco, the Civil War has begun. Right? He has moved to overthrow the standing Republican government after his party in the 1936 elections lost. Right? So fine, democracy didn't work for me, I'm going to use military power. Right? Um, and this leads to a civil war and Picasso is documenting it. Right? Now documenting is not quite the right word, but certainly giving us his opinion about this. Right, and in this, uh, Franco becomes this this monstrous creature. And as I said, he Picasso hasn't bothered with the reversal process, so it reads somewhat like a comic book. But it's going to read backwards, from right to left rather than left to right, because again, he hasn't uh, accounted for the reversal process. So the number one scene of the nine is upper right. And then we read across the top to the left, next one down, 
right to left, and the bottom one right to left, okay? And it's sequential in a way, but not quite as easy as that. So at the very top right, we see uh, Franco as this monster uh, devouring and destroying and gore gouging and goring his own horse. Right? And he, he appears as this figure that has, it looks almost anamorphic or maybe almost like a, I don't know, it looks like something in between, a, like some sort of weird root and some sort of organ from inside your body. People often describe it as a minotaur, but it's, it's, it's morphed away from that. It's not as easy as that. And at the same time, the figure is also meant to be a reference, I think, to a, a medieval knight. Because you'll notice on the far right, there's the banner and there's a sword in the ground at the bottom. This is a combination of etching and aquatint. That's how you get the gray in this, right? And the poor horse is, is disemboweled on the left and laying on its head upside down. But the figure with the, and the teeth in its belly, that monstrous set of sort of teeth running through the stomach, this, that's meant to be Franco. And, and so what we're seeing here is a, is a, what do you want to say, a symbol for the carnage uh, that Franco's uprising against the elected government is, is bringing. And the next two scenes across the top are the horrors of war. Right? This is the Spanish Civil War. So Franco starts it, this is what happens. Right? Uh, dead bodies in the, in the field, dead animals with their riders, uh, almost as if the horse is cuddling it in a way, but again, they're both dead. Right? This is the, the outcome of, of Franco's <coughs> uh, war against Spain, as, as, as Picasso sees it. Um, Picasso is turning, like I said, to his Spanish heritage, and the person he's looking at the most for this is Goya. Francisco Goya, circa 1900, did a series of prints during the, uh, uh, the Napoleonic Wars in Spain. Uh, the Spanish king had been driven out uh, by Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon had installed his brother as king of Spain, but there was an uprising. Right? The people of Spain weren't going to have this. And for five years or so, uh, the people of Spain fought against Joseph Bonaparte, right? Napoleon's brother. And Napoleon had hired mercenary soldiers, Cossacks, who we see in the image, to, to fight for him. And Goya makes this part of his, his statement. You know, they're fighting for money, we're fighting for honor. But he documents the things that he saw in Spain during this period the early 19th century, right? This war against, against the French occupation of Spain. And he sees these horror, horrifying things. And does this uh, series of roughly, I think, 80 prints of the disasters of war. And they're, 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 they're absolutely horrifying. This is one of the more tame ones. Uh, some of them are just utterly horrifying. But Picasso, remember, is mining his Spanish traditions, right? Uh, Goya also did a series of prints of bullfights. Right? And these are all things that are kind of coming into Picasso's orbit, coming part of his vocabulary. And for the dream and lie of Franco, he's inspired, I think, by, by looking back at, at Goya's prints uh, from over 100 years earlier. Right? Not quoting them directly, mind you, but, but certainly making his modern version of the same. On the second tier the monster that is Franco becomes even more monstrous and even more anamorphic. So that figure that still looks somewhat like a knight up above now becomes sort of more three-dimensional. The mouth becomes more obviously a mouth across that belly. And it's just, it's, it's ugly, isn't it? It's really difficult to see. And there you can see he's now confronting a bull, right? Uh, this, this, this thing with a crown on its head. Right, uh, that looks almost like a jester's cap, fool's cap as well. Uh, but it's now confronting this. And so in this case, the, the bull is Spain again, right? Because even with the Minotaur image, uh, the, the half man, half bull is this man who's taken on Spain as his guise, right? So here the bull is Spain, and, and that carnage continues. The, the fight continues in the center, where now uh, that crazy creature takes on this other body that looks like a horse that's now spilling its guts, and there's a, 
the bull is now fighting back. Right? So it's against Spanish Civil War through a surrealist metaphor. Right? The rest of the image you'll notice is somewhat different in style. That the first five panels have that aqua tint, that tone that's been added. But the other four are just line. And that's because he worked on this in two different phases. Did the first five, came back and did the last four. But these now show the results of the carnage. How does this affect the people? Right? The first five, uh, actually there's really just those three in the middle, uh, upper right and the two center right, are about sort of what Franco's doing. And the rest are about the impact it has on Spain. And instead of just seeing people from the war, we're now seeing the impact on everyday life, mothers and children. A woman carrying her dead child, wailing to the sky, another cuddling it, almost like a Katie Colwitz sort of thing, uh, coddling uh, the body of a child. Uh, but they're done in this, this even more immediate style. And like I said, Picasso had been working on a pair of these. So originally there's two prints. And he's, he's publishing them, and he's, and he's selling them, and he's giving all of the proceeds to the rebels fighting against Franco. Right? He's using them to raise money for the, for the fight against Franco, but he's selling them in Paris, right? where he can get away with that, and then sending the money down. So originally, both were to, be, to have uh, images with Aquitin, but he never really finished it. Right? Uh, never finished in the aqua tint on the final four scenes. But even as he's working, he publishes them mid-work, right, before he's done. So even with our uh, number two image, you can see in this particular case that there are, uh, he hasn't added the aqua tint yet, right? He began these in the same way that the final four panels are included. Now, what caused him to add these last four panels was an event that happened in June of 1937. I got the exact date here. Not that they really, no, sorry, April, sorry, April 27th. Um, when Franco lost the election and started the Spanish Civil War, right, tried to take over by military prowess, he needed some help. And who does he turn to in 1937 for help in the Spanish Civil War but Hitler, right? The Nazis come to his to his help to, to fight this war. So again, for Picasso reading about this you know, in, in Paris, right, in between the two powers, uh, knowing that Franco's got Nazi help would have helped him to remember Goya, where we had these images where Bonaparte, right, and Hitler sees himself as sort of the new Napoleon, right? Both of them see themselves as the new Roman emperors, right? But uh, Napoleon had hired mercenary soldiers as well, people who were not engaged with the cause, right? We're only there to support him, not to support uh, uh, the country. So the connection to Goya is, is, is very much related to this, this, uh, uh, this turn of events in the 30s, right? So uh, 1937, Hitler comes to uh, Franco's assistance. And on April 27th, uh, Franco gave Hitler the green light to use one of the rebel villages for target practice. A town in the Basque Mountains was, Guernica, was firebombed, right, for what, three and a half hours straight and burned for days. Over 1,600 civilians were killed. Right. And there was no, it wasn't a strategic play, place so much except that the Basque villagers were part of the rebels fighting against Franco. Right. There was no sort of great uh, highway that ran through there that needed to be closed. For It was just target practice. It was absolutely senseless violence. And this is what inspired Picasso to add the last four panels, or after the horrors of Guernica. Right. And we see uh, the reaction to this bombing. And it just, when you know that, and you know that that's what he's trying to illustrate, this image on the lower left, which is absolutely horrifying, because he's just using his 
I think it's mostly dry point, right? He's going in with the, so to make an etching, you, you manipulate a piece of metal, a flat piece of metal, uh, with grooves that you rub ink into, okay? And then the paper is put on top and with high pressure pulls the ink out of the grooves, okay? Now, there are a number of ways to make those grooves. There's engraving, which was used early in the Renaissance. There is etching, where acid bites those lines. And then there's dry point, where you just like attack it, just scratch the heck out of it, with the idea that any kind of manipulation to that flat, smooth surface will, in fact, hold ink. Okay? So there's an amazing violence to the mark making in the lower left scene, and even the one above, where Picasso, through the making of the work, the actual uh, laying down of the marks, is trying, to, I think, to channel that horrifying negative energy of what happened in, in Guernica. Right? And when the uh, reports of Guernica uh, spread into France and reported there, there were mass, there were marches, there were protest marches. It was just, you know, people were absolutely horrified. Uh, by what had happened, right? And Picasso, of course, is caught up in all of this. And it leads him to create one of his most famous works, right? Uh, simply called Guernica uh, at the exact same time. It's this massive, massive mural, um, 25 and a half feet across the base, right? Almost 12 feet tall. And it's a commission piece to be displayed in the Spanish Pavilion at the World's Fair in 1937 that was held in Paris. Which is, by the way, is kind of an, I, I don't want to get, we're so far behind anyway, but I, the, Spanish, the, the World's Fair in 1937 is a really fascinating event. We don't really have World's Fairs that often anymore, but each country had a pavilion. That meant the Nazis had a pavilion there. That meant that, the, uh, that Stalin had a pavilion there, right? Uh, and, and so did the Spanish. And the Spanish, because the Civil War is still going on, right? The Republican government has not yet been toppled. They're fighting against Franco. The government, the elected government, gets to choose what goes in. And they use their pavilion to do nothing but talk about what it means to be Spanish and how freaking horrible Franco is, right? And this is at the same one where the Nazis are all of like, this is what makes Nazis so great, you know, and this is... Stalin was an ally of ours, but, you know, what makes the Soviet uh, government so great. And this is all right around the, uh, the old um, exhibition area, which is around the Eiffel Tower, right, on either side of the Seine on the Eiffel Tower, uh, uh, by the Eiffel Tower. And the, the Soviet uh, pavilion and the Nazi pavilion were right across the alley from each other. And they're just sort of like each one of them has a tower and each one of them has figures doing this on each other, which is pretty cool in itself, right? There's the, the Soviet one has these workers with size and the, the Nazi one has the, the eagle, you know, facing each other. Well, there's the, this was the Spanish one, right? And it's been recreated, I think, in Madrid. Uh, but Picasso's was commissioned for it, right? To be the sort of the centerpiece. And it doesn't show up in the pavilion until about three months into the show. So there's this sort of big, because he's working on it, right? It's fresh um, at the time. And here's a photo of the pavilion with it in it, right? Uh, the sculpture in the foreground is an Alexander Calder, an American artist who we're going to look at. Um, I'm not quite sure why he's there, right? Uh, other than uh, his works evoke, like uh, Miro's do, the sense of the spiritual, uh, the sense of uh, the metaphysical, and maybe that beyond all this war there's something better um, waiting for us. Miro was there too. He did this monster mural. It's been lost, right? Would be part of this as well, which is again the idea of maybe transcending the horrors of the earth to find something better. And you can see that his goes the top two stories of the pavilion, right? Uh, whereas Picasso's is down at ground level. So that's certainly a metaphor as well. But what Picasso does in, a, in again, the style that we've seen developing since post cubism which is where it looks like cutouts. It looks like synthetic cubism on a certain level, but in monochrome, primarily grays, right? But senses of parts of it being cut out newspapers, right, with the tick marks that make up the horse in the center, uh, maybe even things that look like musical scores, areas that also look like what we've seen in the etchings, and even some of the figures 
uh, that were there in the etchings repeat here as well. Right. And it is, of course, meant to be the horrors inflicted by Franco. Right? And so we see the, uh, uh, the bull metaphor again, and again, Picasso's fluid with this metaphor as being either Spain on the one hand or Franco on the other. Right? And it's coming now, blasting into the scenes, screaming, and causing this carnage we see everywhere. And the more you look, the more you realize people are coming in, uh, people are dying, people are screaming, flames everywhere. And this is all happening under the cover of darkness. There's this one incandescent light at the top that suggests that this is all happening at night. But the way the bull comes in from the left here is very, very similar to the way the, in the Minotaur's battle it was coming in from the opposite side, right? Which again, remember the reversal process, right? Um, again, let's see, let's, come on, be good to me, there we are. Uh, reacting to the, the blasts and, and Picasso distilling this down to flames rising from buildings uh, as the people are, are reacting to this. So Picasso is, is very much uh, influenced by surrealism and use, but uses it in a very personal way, sort of to his own purposes. Melds it into his cubist idiom, right? But again, also with, with, with politics um, very, very deeply in mind. And we're going to move from there to talk about surrealism in America because this will set up very well the last section of this class, which is on abstract expressionism. Because the Surrealist movement that began in 1924, really took hold around 1930, uh, goes international. And just like Dada before it, because Dada had sort of set the stage for this, right? Dada was everywhere. And since Surrealism grows from Dada, you might expect that, yeah, that's going to happen. Not just in Paris, but elsewhere. And that's exactly the case. Everywhere we look, we find that Surrealism becomes sort of the dominant art movement of the 1930s. And this is true late 20s and 30s. And this is true in America as well, particularly in New York, right? Where Dada had already been very, very strong in the teens and the early part of the 20s with Duchamp, Picabia, and Man Ray, right? And others that we didn't look at. So as we look at American art in the late 20s and early 30s, we start to see some legacy of European modernism beginning to creep into it. On one level, I, with Stuart Davis, we, I think there's certainly a, uh, an element of cubism here. Uh, the idea of collage, not really collaged, right? But evoked by the way he handles the painted forms, suggesting uh, layers, right? Uh, but at the same time, adopting a sort of surrealist take, a Dada surrealist take, by juxtaposing objects. Um, and he calls it egg beater number four, but is the egg beater easy to detect here? You know, what he's interested in with the egg beater, and, and this is, I think, something that comes out of Dada, is this machine. Think of, think of uh, Bacabia and his interest in gears and whatnot, right? This sort of wiry machine that is both solid and permeated that you can see through. And he takes that motif and he turns it into this lattice work of wires throughout the entire work where it becomes very difficult to see the egg beater in it. Now, it's egg beater number four. There was a whole series of these, right? And in some of them, the egg beater is certainly more easy to see. But in this particular case, uh, if we look at the entire series, the forms that we're left with here derive from an egg beater, <clears throat> an electric fan, and a rubber glove. And Lena's going, huh? Right? Not only, huh, can I find them, but, huh, what do these things have to do with each other? Right? Now, there's our Dada element right there, isn't it? The, or even surrealist element. The juxtaposition of normal things in a way that makes you question their original, what was it, identity. Right, their original meaning. When you take things out of context and put them into a different context, can you change the meaning of them? Right? We certainly know that works with words. Can it work with objects as well? 
does the meaning of the object change when it's juxtaposed with different objects? And that's sort of what surrealism has been doing, sometimes more recognizably than others, right? But think to Hannah Hoke or John Hartfield, our Berlin Dada photo montage artists, right? Our collage artists are doing exactly that. Picasso's doing something different with his collages, isn't he? He's putting things together to develop a meaning, not to change it, but to nuance a central idea. He's not trying to confuse and confound. He's trying to build. But with our surrealists, what we find is the elements get put together in a way that is intended to make you question the nature of physical reality. This is what surrealism, right? Super real, above the real world, is meant for us to do, is to question the nature of physical reality. That's why they're so interested in dreams, right? Is again, it's not physical reality. So Stuart Davis is, is, is entering into this dialogue as well. And he begins it in New York, very much influenced by Dada. But then he travels to Paris as well and spends some time around 1928, 1930, in Paris and begins to then encounter the Surrealists firsthand. Right? And that has a huge impact on his art. Now, it's not all Surrealists. How many are just incredibly charming? Right? Uh, they kind of remind me of Dufy, don't they? I mean, very much so. And that would be an interesting thing to pursue. Uh, with this, but he does these, and, and again, there's this sort of uh, musical notation at the top that seems to hang there. Uh, there's a playfulness to the line uh, that he's using. That he, not every work has the same sort of strength of abstraction uh, that we see in Egg Beater Number Four, right? He does these wonderful, evocative scenes of, of Parisian streets. Um, where that same sort of linear quality that we're seeing in Eggbeater sort of appear in the way he outlines the cafe. Uh, but playing with the medium, it's all done with, with palette knife. And in fact, he's even mixing sand into some of the, the paint. The black building, you can see here more clearly, is granular. Right? Remember that Masson, Andre Masson, the uh, automatic painter, had been putting sand in his paint. So had Picasso, for that matter, back in the teens. I think Davis is responding to those things now that he's gotten to Paris and seen things firsthand, rather than just in magazine illustrations. Right? But his brand of surrealism is sort of quasi-cubist, where he's again, he's throwing things together in a way that doesn't necessarily add up, as the cubists did, to a particular experience. Uh, we have a, a, a guitar here, or a lute, perhaps. Um, some sort of pyramid at the top. Uh, why is it called still life with the saw? Where's the saw in all of this? Is it just that white thing? Oh, oh is it a metronome? Yeah. I hadn't thought of that but because of the way the, the, the lines look like bricks, but that's a very good point. That's very, and you know, what, remember, object to be destroyed. Yeah. Right? Man Ray with the metronome with the eyeball on it, right? Uh, I wonder if he'd seen that or had heard about it, right? It was destroyed by that point. Right? He hadn't remade it yet. Um, but elements that even to a certain degree, the way the rope in the foreground loops around, or the green bit at the upper left, which doesn't really evoke much of anything, all suggest that he's been looking around. Right? He's been looking certainly at Cubist stuff for the, for the musical metaphor. But also those, those sort of lilting lines that move through uh, suggest to me that he's also been, oops, sorry about that, it's responding slowly, looking at Miro. Right, where remember our, 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 our horse trainer, uh, which became this sort of later in his work, a sort of an image of, of, of female genitalia, right? Uh, but that, that those forms floating against a, a, a plain background reappear in Stuart Davis's own work as well. So Americans are responding uh, very, very strongly to, to the impact of surrealism. Uh, and Stuart Davis in particular because he goes to, goes to Europe. Right? But it doesn't all end up looking like Miro. Right? American surrealism takes on a number of different um, uh, manifestations. Right? 
And there's a whole group of American artists who we tend to call surrealists who look at nature very closely and in so doing find something supernatural within it and try to emphasize the supernatural elements, the surreal elements, the metaphysical elements. These are all metaphors. They're all synonyms, right? The metaphysical elements of the, of the physical world. And in this group, the most famous is George O'Keefe, uh, who you may have heard of before in this class. She's certainly that kind of famous. Uh, who does these close-ups of plant forms <clears throat> that are in one or another level of abstraction. And the point of moving from uh, a very precise rendering, and you can still see that there's a certain precision to her work. Look at the sharp edgedness of that of that uh, that maple leaf, right? Stacked there. There's a sense that she, she could probably draw it as precise as she wanted to. Keep in mind Picabia and his precise drawings from the Dada group in New York, right? have a long-standing impact on American art. Uh, but O'Keefe has a sort of precise way of rendering that then becomes abstract, if you can do both at once. right? Where she's trying to preserve some elements of the nature she is precisely rendering, but the elements that she's preserving are meant to elevate it beyond the physical and make it into something with supernatural power. And for O'Keefe, that supernatural power is the power of womanhood. Because as we look at her works, and this will become more obvious in just a second or two, what she's finding as she looks at them is female genitalia. Sometimes more obviously than others. As she gazes deep into flowers, into leaves, she starts to see in a non-threatening way, right, vaginas. Unlike Miro, which is sort of, you know, very kind of creepy gendered. Right? This, is, this is more empowerment. Because, of course, she's a woman artist. It makes sense that that would be uh, extolling the virtues of, of, of her own experience and seeing that in nature. Now, O'Keefe uh, brings up another element. So we talk about surrealism in America, right? Uh, and modern art in America. Um, there are a number of ways in which American artists become familiar with modern art. Because up to this point, the majority of modern art that we've seen has been European, right? It's all come out of Paris, other centers, Berlin, right, uh, Russia. But it's been a Eurocentric movement prior to roughly 1920. And the, the American moderns that we've seen have been the Dada group, two out of the three of which were French, right? Picabi and Duchamp. Man Ray was American. But guess what? Man Ray then goes to Paris. Okay? So uh, how do, what happens with American moderns? How do they become uh, adopt moderns? For you and me, right, we can go to museums. Easy peasy, right? Or you take an art history class and see nice digital pictures on the screen. Not the same in 1930, right? And not as easy to do. Museums were still very much, uh, uh, what do you want to say, wedded to the idea of the European tradition, right? Renaissance and Baroque art. It was what you could see if you went to museums. Uh, modern art for Americans was much more difficult. So it's very interesting for us to find out how they got it, right? <clears throat> Stuart Davis goes, right? A lot of American artists go. Right? But some venues in America brought it to them. Okay? Uh, we talked before about in 1913, there was the Armory Show. Did we talk about that? I don't have it on the slide, right? The Armory Show in New York. It's, a, it's an annual show, right? The 1913 Armory Show. Is it the 68th Street Armory, I think? An armory is where the, uh, the army stores its munitions, right? But there was this big empty armory, armory in Manhattan, still there, right? Uh, that was used for uh, major art exhibitions. 
And in the 1913 Armory Show, uh, Duchamp's new descending the staircase was there. Right, Maccabi's reception was there. Uh, there was some early Leger was there, right? It was a major place for Americans to see modernism. And a lot of people say that at the 1913 Armory Show, American artists split between those who loved this stuff and those who said, ain't no way I'm ever going there. And turned more hardly to traditional realism, right? In the gritty images of urban scenes and whatnot, or, or even regional events. That kind of divided the American. So this is one place that we could get Ameri where Americans could have seen it, but it's an event, right? It's a one-off, and the stuff that was there leaves after the show closes. Another place where American artists could see European modernism was Alfred Stieglitz, and we talked about him before as well. He was friends with the copy. Remember, uh, look, Stieglitz is here, right? That image of the broken camera with the automobile gear shift in neutral, right? So Stieglitz and his gallery, 291 in New York on Fifth Avenue, was another place where American artists could, on a more frequent, regular basis, see modern art and get acquainted with some of its ideas by people who were sensitive to it and understood it, right? So O'Keefe is Stieglitz's wife, right? So she's, she's part of this broader Stieglitz circle, right? Stieglitz becomes the hub of American modernism, late teens, early 20s. And O'Keefe becomes sensitive to European modern ideas, and in particular surrealism, via Alfred Stieglitz. So she's looking at the natural world, and I could use these exact same words to talk about Magritte or Dali or Miro. She's looking at the natural world and she is taking what she sees and translating it into something that evokes greater mystery, greater connections, greater powers. Right? Um, but she's doing it in a way that's not necessarily similar to what we see in European modernism. Right? But they're very much based on, on nature stuff. Wonderful images of leaves, right? Uh, where, again, everything you can, you can still glean the, the natural form from which it derives. Right? But then you begin to see how she's turned that into these patterns uh, that fill up the space and the background becomes even more abstract than the leaf that remains in the foreground uh, with these incredibly lush and rich colors. Now we're very fortunate at the National Gallery to have a series of images that she did of a plant called, a flower called the Jack in the Pulpit, where she works it through a series of six different stages that lead from recognizable to abstract. And as she does, the stamen of the flower becomes even that much more vaginal, right? And it, it's not like a, like a, like a Nero where, or, a, or, a, or a Picasso where it's threatening, right? It, it rather is this idea of that being at the heart of the power of the world. It's this very sort of personal, uh, what do you want to call it? Personal metaphysics, right? A, a, a personal religion, if you pantheism, personal pantheism uh, that she develops. And she'll work it through so that the form that we see here in the center, right? I think that's called the stamen, but I don't know. Is that what that is? What's the bit in the middle? I'm sure that's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. We'll call it that for now, and we'll ask our bio biological friends later. That becomes the theme that runs through all of these. And as we move to, like, number six in the series, that's all that's left, right, is that thing. Um, with Jesus on the wall, I don't know how far to talk about this, right? But I mean, there, it's, it's clitoral, you know? It's this thing inside the middle of it that's the sensitive part that's at the root of everything. It's the root of the power of the issue. And that, that, you can't deny it's here, you know, that this is really part of the, what she's working with and finding a, 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 a feminine power within all of nature. Uh, wherever she looks. Right. 
So O'Keefe represents, um, as opposed to Stuart Davis, a very different kind of approach towards realism, one that's nature-based, right? And looking to nature to find this metaphysical power, and with her in particular, one that relies on, on gendering nature, right? Uh, feminizing nature, all elements of it. Another American surrealist, here he comes, is Arthur Dove. And I was just talking to uh, Sarah, Professor Hardesty, about this because she hadn't heard of him. And I was like, oh, well, and I, I love Arthur Dove. And I had this argument with my friend who teaches at Marymount Manhattan who loves Stuart Davis. And then he was like, I, I love him. He goes, no, he's a hack. And I said, no, 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 he's up there, man. And, I, and he's a recent discovery for me because I've never really heard much about him. But we're lucky here because the Phillips collection has like a ton of Stuart Davis. I'm not arguing Arthur Dove's. And like O'Keefe, he's looking at nature to find something great, right? Look, he wants to reproduce nature, but not as, it's, as it looks. What he wants to represent from nature is its power. And so he's going to translate it into form that then can become that power, rather than simply representing anything in particular. So this storm becomes this pattern that you might almost, except for its lack of objectivity, you might almost mistake for an O'Keefe, right? Where the clouds become these symphony of golds that move over the surface of the panel. Right? Uh, and Dub does this quite a bit with his work. He looks at natural events, but he also, like O'Keefe, looks closely at the things around him, like this, this moth from the National Gallery, where he's looking down and he's seeing in it something more than just a moth. He's looking at the world around him and finding something, something greater, right? something more spectacular. Now, he was broke. He, 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 his paintings didn't sell. Uh, Americans are, are well behind the Europeans when it comes to Accepting modern art as sort of part of it. And I think to this day we feel that way. And part of it's maybe our Puritan past, right? But we're just, we're not as into being challenged by art as our European neighbors have been. Certainly not true in, in the 20s. Um, and Dove's works weren't particularly popular. Uh, and he was so broke that, in fact, he, in order to survive, he and his wife lived on a houseboat in, in, on Long Island, back when that was meant to poor rather than rich. These days, live on a houseboat on Long Island, you have to get some money. Huntington Harbor, um, he volunteered as a deckhand in order to have a place to live in a boat that was moored at the harbor, because he was a qualified deckhand. Right? He did that, and, then, and then what he would do is he would take the stuff that he had around him, so it was laying around on the deck would be the stuff that he would often make the pictures out of. Sailcloth, for example, right? Uh, people are going to repair their boats, they're going to pull off the sails and replace them with new sails, he gets the old cloth, uses it for paints, right? Free canvas, right? The wood that people use, for, it becomes the wood that he would use to, to make his works, right? He's, he's cobbling it together, right? Uh, and some of the works are dissimilar from this, and this is what I like about Arthur Dove. Um, one of them was he's a fantastic official. He's got pieces of shirts and pants that have been uh, uh, synthetic cubism, right? Collaged together with bamboo that suggests the fishing poles, uh, placed into this sort of craft, crafted little box, right? On the right, uh, sand mixed into the paint, pieces of sailcloth. Um, simply called Huntington Harbor because that's where he found the stuff, but utterly unrepresentational. He was part of the Stiglitz Circle back in the teens. And he had gone to Paris like 1910, was one of the very first artists to ever make a painting that was totally abstract. Right? Back in 1910. So now he's living back in America, this stuff's not fine. He's making stuff sort of for his own interest, right? Uh, because he has to. This is what he does, right? I mean, he can't not make art, uh, regardless of whether or not any of it's selling. Well, he lucks out. He, he finds somebody who loves his stuff. He finds a, a patron. Um, and this patron is Duncan Phillips. 
of the Phillips collection. Uh, Duncan Phillips, wealthy industrialist, uh, loves modern art. He's one of the, the you know the small handful in America who are eating this stuff up and thinking this is a great thing. <clears throat> and Phillips has an idea to open a museum that he can use to teach the rest of America. In 1921, he comes up with this idea. Open a museum that will be an educational tool that will enlighten America to the benefits of modern art. European modernism, but more importantly, will be the place where Americans who are struggling to do something similar will have a home. Right? Right? And it's still there, right? I wish it were free, but you know. Students get in really cheap, right? I have to pay a lot. Or become a member. But the Phillips Collection, as we know it, right, in the DuPont area, was open because Duncan Phillips wanted to educate Americans about modern art. And he saw Arthur Dove's pieces. And he went, Nice. He paid Duncan Phillips an annual stipend, for lack of a better word, to have the right of first refusal. Anything that Duncan, that Arthur Dove made, Duncan Phillips had the and paid for the right to be the first person who could buy it before it went to the market. The right of first refusal. Right? And this is why there's about 25 really good Arthur does in the Phillips collection. Right? Is that he became a lifelong supporter of Arthur Dunn's work. So here, uh, I think these were intended as pendants because they're exactly the same size. Right? Uh, morning sun, evening sun. Side by side. And in each of them, Dove is doing what Dove does best, which is to look at the landscape and see it for all of its metaphysical power. Right? Uh, he, the fields down below, the, the plowed fields seem alive. As he, I think these are probably the same view. Well, looking opposite directions, obviously. Uh, the same view. But you know how the evening sun seems larger than the morning sun. He captures that. He amplifies it. The fields with the plowing become uh, uh, pantheistically alive. Right? Um, and different in different times of the day. The sun becomes this, this wonderful looks like a, like a laser beam. Right? It's a glinting in white in the middle of the yellow beam in the morning. And at night becomes this vortex of flame. Right? Again, looking at nature and not trying to illustrate what it looks like, but trying to communicate how he feels about it, its power. Right? This is Arthur Duff's greatest story. So I've become a huge fan of his stuff a lot. Um, the one that's on the slide sheet for the for the final is this one, Me and the Moon. It's the same idea, right? It's looking now at things in the world. And notice the emph emphasis on, in many of these, on, on things that aren't in the world. They're up above, right? The storms and the sun and the moon. And we saw how Moreau was interested in constellations, right? And, and they're, they're the great thing for us because they're physical, but they're not, right? In the same way that they were the stuff of mythology for the ancient Greeks, right? The stars and the, the heavenly bodies. And so, you know, on the left, it, it's the moon, but it's not. And at the same time, he captures that glow from that slightly cool yellow moon that isn't a perfect orb, the way it seems, right? It, it, it's shimmering. And then in the sky around it, are, are those meant to be fire? Are they meant to be anything? Fireflies, you know, clouds. It doesn't matter. He's trying to capture, I think, the lyricism of, of, of a moonlit night. The sense of wonder. That I, I still get. It's one of the places I still get from you know, as I'm looking at this, the night sky. Right? Or maybe they're the, the they're, they're stars, you know, dancing through the skies. But they're connected by that beautiful Miro-like line. Right? Doesn't it kind of remind you of Miro? And his sort of odd 
thematic painting, that there's a sense that maybe Dove, as he starts to paint these areas, doesn't know where they're going. And you can almost imagine that serpentine line that starts in the blue, the blue against the brown, the upper right corner. Right? And then starts to wind its way down. Was the first thing he painted that he fills in between this open start. Right? Automatic painting coming out of surrealism being something that Dub, I think, is using as well to, to capture this. Now, the title, and we'll quit with this, the title, Me and the Moon, actually comes from a song that was popular in 1936. And I'm going to see if I can do this or not, if it'll play. And this would be a great place to stop because it's perfect. If, it'll, if it will. Let's see how my Wi-Fi goes. Trying. You may have to do it at home. Hit this and start it again and see what happens. There it goes. So this is the song that inspired this, this painting. Sorry about the skipping. that lilting line, right, starts to make a lot more sense. in the upper right corner, you can see the thickness of the paint, right, which you couldn't achieve with watercolor. But it's a good question because it really does end up looking like the way he handles the uh, transitions between the areas end up having that effect, right? Uh, a wet on wet effect almost, right? And I think that we'll see other painters doing that exact same thing roughly the same time uh, as art becomes increasingly more abstract from this point on. We've got one, two more surrealist artists to work on and then we'll bounce into abex, abstract expressionism, because that's really growing directly out of this um, on Tuesday, okay? So um, if you have, as you're working this weekend on your papers, if you have further questions, uh, don't hesitate to email me, but you know, since